Next up, we have Tito Valdez, and Tito's bill is to amend Title 23, providing for civil unions and revising provisions relating to marriage and divorce. Hello, everyone, and thank you all for being here today. Before discussing my legislation, I would like to begin by thanking every single individual that has helped me throughout this process. This experience has truly been one of extraordinary academic, professional, and personal growth. I'm very thankful to the BMC program, specifically Mr. Ray Whitaker, our program's coordinator, and the office of the chief clerk. I want to thank Team Hannah, Angela, Alicia, Donna, Andy, Adam, and Gail. It was truly the best office that I could have, I, I could have been put in, and I, I'm going to miss you guys very much. Thank you to Ted Martin of Equality Pennsylvania, who made time to meet with me to discuss my legislative proposal. I want to thank all of the members and staff here who have helped me over the past several months. The folks in the Judiciary Committee, Senator Leach and his wonderful staff, Senator Furlow, Representative Fleck, Representative Patty Kim, Representative Dean, David Brogan, Audrey Powell, Michael Schwoyer, Carrie Goodyear, and the Legislative Reference Bureau, particularly A.J. Mendelson and Jim Walsh, who were key in the drafting process of my legislation. I want to thank my fellow interns who, through our shared experiences, grew together and built relationships that I know will transcend this amazing experience, even after we leave the Capitol for the last time today as interns. Lastly, I need to thank all of my family and friends and my network of support at Lebanon Valley College. People like Venus Ricks, April Dix, Caitlin Marr, Michael Schock, Kathy Romagnolo, Chris Dolan, Diane Johnson, Philip Benish, Jennifer Evans, <clears throat> excuse me, Todd Snovel, Tina Washington, and Malcolm Lazen have made my experience throughout college a wonderful one, and their invaluable support this semester is appreciated more than I could ever come close to expressing. I'd like to begin by sharing a story that should humanize this issue. It should help you understand why this is a pressing issue and why it needs to be addressed today. Joanne Ritchie, a housing administrator, and Sharon Reed, a psychotherapist, are two productive members of society. They are taxpayers, they pursued higher education. They have tons of accolades. They are also a very happy couple of 17 years. Now imagine a world where the mandates of the United States Constitution reign supreme and true equality for all people is the norm. That, unfortunately, is not the world that Joanne Ritchie and Sharon Reed found themselves in on the night of September 3rd, 2005. Joanne was moved to the intensive care unit and came under the care of a contract nurse. That night, their lives changed forever. Despite the fact that Joanne's doctor permitted Sharon to be by her side constantly, the nurse refused Sharon access to Joanne's room and bedside, continually, continually evicting her from the room. By the time Sharon regained access to her partner of 17 years the next morning, Joanne's condition had deteriorated and she was heavily drugged. Unfortunately, Joanne passed away within a matter of hours. This could be the experience of any same-sex couple in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania because there are no current laws on the books that, per that offer protections to the LGBT community. Same-sex couples aren't protected when it comes to hospital visitation rights, state tax benefits, access to family health insurance policies, joint credit, co-parenting privileges and responsibilities, inheritance rights, and much more. Given that this is a serious problem that has left an entire group of people disenfranchised, a solution is necessary. This is a very controversial topic, and I'm aware of that. Anyone can tell by turning on their television, reading the local newspaper, or reading about current events online. Politicians from both sides of the aisle have expressed their opinions and have made proposals about where we should go. It has been the long-standing public policy of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to define marriage as a union between one man and one woman. The issue of marriage equality has perhaps been one of the most contentious of our time. Is marriage a civil right? Would redefining it to include same-sex couples infringe upon religious freedoms? All these questions are great questions that are, are valid and they warrant ample discussion. However, they rest upon the presupposition that the government is best equipped to make decisions regarding the business of marriage. It is not. In terms of constitutional applicability, there are two main mandates regarding this issue. The Constitution requires that we protect the religious freedoms of all people. It also requires that we provide equal protection under the law. The idea of privatizing marriage may seem convoluted to some unfamiliar with what this would entail. The language I have chosen in addressing this course of action is straightforward. What I have elected to do is remove the government's control over the business of marriage. 
My legislation seeks to address this issue by giving the private sector complete reign over the business. Any couple interested in getting married may do so privately. This marriage would be strictly ceremonial and would not be recognized by the government. Because marriage has historically brought about certain legal rights and responsibilities, the government must continue to recognize the union of two consenting non-related adults in some way. My legislation does this by providing for civil unions as the new government sanctions spousal relationship. Everything about the spousal relationship remains the same as it pertains to the application process, divorce, custody, etc. My legislation is a series of amendments to Title 23, Pens Pennsylvania's domestic relations statute, and they systematically replace the word marriage with civil union and eliminate any consideration of the gender identity and or sexual orientation of the parties to a civil union in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Marriage remains an option for solemnization of the civil union. By this I mean, if you wish to have your spousal relationship recognized by the government through a civil union and later want to honor your union with a formal matrimonial ceremony, you are entitled to do that. My legislation does not impede on private action once you are civilly unionized. It also does not infringe upon the rights of couples married prior to the enactment of my legislation. Under my legislation, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania will recognize the marriages and civil unions of couples from other states. Our government will also interpret federal legislation referring specifically to marriage as applicable to our only legal equivalent, civil unions. Another significant change in my legislation is related to the cost of the actual license. Currently, the law states that a marriage license fee is worth $3, with a portion of it going to the county in which the marriage takes place, and another portion remaining with the Commonwealth. My legislation seeks to increase the fee to $6 for inflationary purposes. There are some who may ask why this issue is important to discuss and address at this time when there are so many pressing issues facing the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the United States as a whole. Basic civil rights are very important and must be addressed. They must always take the forefront. But is the ability to marry, or in, my, in the case of my legislation, unionize a civil right? The answer to this question I have found lies in adjudicative methodology. The Supreme Court in Loving v. Virginia made it very clear that it is in fact a civil right. In his majority opinion, Justice Earl Warren said, marriage is one of the basic civil rights of man, fundamental to our very existence and survival. To deny this fundamental freedom on so unsupportable a basis as the racial classifications embodied in these statutes, classifications so directly subversive to the principle of equality at the heart of the 14th Amendment, is surely to deprive all the state citizens of liberty without due process of the law. A discussion about marriage and the direction the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania should be taking on this issue is not unprecedented. The United States Supreme Court has taken on the issue of marriage equality, and several states have tackled it through legislative action, judicial mandates, and even referendums through which the voters have had the opportunity to be a part of the discussion. Connecticut, Iowa, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, Vermont, Washington, and Washington, D.C. all currently allow same-sex marriage. Delaware, Hawaii, Illinois, New Jersey, and Rhode Island all offer civil unions for same-sex couples. As mentioned before, the United States Supreme Court has taken up the issue of marriage equality. It heard cases that dealt with Proposition 8 in the state of California, as well as the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. The court may choose to rule in one of three ways. It can rule that it's up to the states to define marriage. It can uphold the rights of same-sex couples in California by maintaining the legality of gay marriage in that state. And number three, it can uphold the legality of gay marriage in the state of California and apply this ruling to the rest of the country. What will happen with this case or this series of cases is strictly hypothetical. No one knows what the justices are thinking. No one knows what the justices are talking about. But one thing is clear. The discussion has started. The Supreme Court justices, by taking on this issue in the nation's highest court, have sent a message to the rest of the country. This discussion is important and we need to be having it. Institutional change is forthcoming. In, additional, in addition to institutional change regarding marriage, society has also changed its opinion on the issue. Polls indicate much stronger support than ever before for marriage equality in this country and specifically in Pennsylvania. In a recent poll released by Equality Pennsylvania, it was determined that an estimated 62% of Pennsylvanians agree that the LGBT community is entitled to the same civil rights as other minority groups. A 69% of Pennsylvanians agree that the LGBT community is entitled to protections against being fired due to their sexual orientation and or gender identity. A 72% of Pennsylvanians disagree with the idea of allowing hotels and private businesses to refuse, to, to refuse service to people based on their sexual orientation and or gender identity. 
I stand by the position of empowering the private sector while providing legal protection to all couples in the Commonwealth at the same time. My legislation epitomizes the appreciation for individual freedom on which this great country was founded. I take pride in the times when Pennsylvania has been on the right side of history. So it's very simple. Let's get this done. It's the right thing to do. It's time for Pennsylvania policymakers to make it clear that the, bus that the business of marriage is not a core function of government and that for this reason, the government must remove itself from it. Growing up, we make a pledge to our country in our classrooms and our policymakers make the same pledge every time they are in session. As a reminder, the pledge reads as follows. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Indi <laughs> one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. I'll close with a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Thank you. And now I'll open to questions if anybody has any. Thank, thank you very much for putting together this proposal. Sure. Um, you may not be of this age yet, but for someone who's a little older, um, if you've ever been asked to help put together a wedding, not your own wedding, mm -hmm. but a friend or a relative's wedding, and to do that wedding quickly, uh, for good reasons, uh, you might find the challenge of trying to find someone to officiate at that wedding. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to bring attention to you on page 14 of the booklet. Um, Section B, right on the top. Mm -hmm. Your proposal talks about privatizing weddings. Right. Or pri privatizing, privatizing the, the, the institution of marriage and giving it the term civil union to get government out of the business. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was interesting because on section B, it actually lets people marry themselves, um, which is kind of interesting. And it, it, it lets two people if you don't want a minister or a judge, it's privatizing the officiating of the wedding. Right. And I, my understanding, having put this to, having helped someone do this, uh, that this may be because of the Quaker background in Pennsylvania, that they may not necessarily believe that you need a minister that you can right. solemnize together and then get married. So I just thought it was interesting that Pennsylvania has a tradition of not only, uh, of actually privatizing the officiating of wedding and uh, beyond any government official or anyone else specified in the earlier pages, 13 and 12, um, that it actually lets people get marry themselves. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Hi. Uh, obviously a very interesting and timely presentation given the, the Supreme Court arguments that were just made the other week. A question for you, if, if one were to accept the premise that you've stated behind the legislation, and I, I, I personally don't, but if one would, mm -hmm. my question is why would you include in your bill the requirement that it be two non-related adults, and on page six you list the degrees of prohi prohibited degrees of consanguinity. Right. In other words, you're, you're saying certain people uh, based on their family relationships, cannot marry under or have a civil union under this bill. Kind of curious what the moral or, or legal or right. practical justification for excluding them from, from the civil union would be. I think that these issues are of serious contention. You know, morality is something that um, our legislators have attempted to dictate and or to legislate, and it's not always successful. So I'm tackling one issue at a time. I didn't want to get into the topic of incest and whether or not the state should be in the business of, of saying that you can be a part of that. So in the, in the drafting process, the only thing that I did, Title 23 in itself isn't substantially changed. The only thing that changes is that every single time that the word marriage is mentioned, it's taken out and replaced with the word civil union. Everything else about the process remains the same in terms of who can enter into that contract. Um, I didn't want to change. I didn't want to change anything else and say that I, you know, have anybody else say that I'm doing anything that's unprecedented, um, w with, of course, the exception of providing for civil unions. But I didn't want to change anything about the actual contractual capacity of two people to enter into that type of a union. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Actually, you don't delete the word marriage every time it appears, and in fact, you continue to use the term 
a few different times, um, but, at, but you delete the definition of marriage and marriage license. Well, are you looking at the, the, anytime that marriage is in parentheses, that just means that that's, it's been removed. I know, the but there are places where you have not removed it. Is, are you referring to the part of solemnization, perhaps? Because there is a section on solemnization where I mentioned in my speech that um, marriage is an option for solemnization so that if a couple comes to the government and wants to be recognized legally, they can still have a matrimonial cer cer um, ceremony privately, but it's not sanctioned by the government. It, it's, I mean, I haven't, I haven't seen marriage mentioned anywhere else with that exception, but if there is, and you can point it out to me, it, it was just an error in drafting, and we can certainly look into taking it out. Well, there's a couple different places. On page 11, which is the section on uh, persons qualified to solemnize a civil union, you've removed the word marriage or marriages in a few different places, but then on the next page, on page 13, in subsection B, religious organizations on line 13 right. and line 19, the word marriage still appears, but it's now an undefined term because you've removed it on page two. So maybe it'd be a good idea to leave the definition. Well, I think you probably need to leave the definition. Okay, that's a good suggestion. Um, because then even on the last page, you mentioned marriage. Um, any marriage that's entered into uh, page 42. Uh -huh. um, section 13, your numbers one and two mention marriage. But again, that's now an undefined term. Okay. And actually, your paragraph three seems to contradict paragraphs one and two on page 42. Um, the act doesn't affect a marriage that's entered into before the effective date of the section, and yet paragraph three says a marriage entered into before the effective date of the section is now deemed a civil union. Right. So that's contradictory. It either uh, affects it or it doesn't in affect my, it. In, in my drafting, when we were talking about it, we wanted to include sections one and two, or you know, those subsections in section 13 that made it clear that um, a couple that was married prior to the enactment of my legislation would not need to go back and get their union recertified. So that's really what that means. Um, maybe there could be some further clarity, and that's something that you know I appreciate you bringing up. Thank you. Another part, um, the you know, there's still the term divorce, which includes, I think, I think I saw, includes a reference to marriage. Um, I guess I'm just, and uh, the foreign marriage or civil union on page three, mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm just concerned why you think that you've removed government oversight in this whole thing, because you, they're still requiring a license, still requiring judicial review, right? still requiring, um, there's still provisions for a divorce or right. dissolution of the union right. and alimony and property settlement sure. or division. So obviously the government still has oversight right. of these things. The government has oversight over the new government sanctioned spousal relationship. One of the central arguments against gay marriage is that marriage is a holy institution. I'm not saying that I necessarily buy into the argument that allowing same-sex couples to take part in marriage would somehow trump the rights of, of you know, couple, heterosexual couples. But if that's the argument, I think that it's important to empower the private sector by allowing them to have control over the work and to define marriage in whatever, in whatever way that they want. But the government still needs to provide for a spousal relationship that's recognized by the government because there are legal rights and responsibilities that come with it. So it's just not called marriage anymore. It's the same process, it's just not called marriage anymore. We're allowing the private sector to define the word however they want because that's the issue of contention, the word. So in, in my understanding, you know, if it's a holy institution, if marriage, if the word marriage, you know, brings about a sense of, you know, religion, it's religiosity, and that's fine. Let's just take it out of government and allow the churches, any, any section of the private sector to decide how they want to define it. But the definition of marriage in the current law has no religious connotation. It's simply a contract between a right. man and a woman. Right, but the, one of the central arguments against legalizing same-sex marriage is that it is a holy institution. It, do I view it as a holy institution? Personally, no, I don't. But that is obviously a valid opinion that a lot of, otherwise we wouldn't be having this discussion. You know, that is one of the central arguments against it. So I'm just trying to empower the private sector and allow them to do what they want in terms of the word marriage. Okay, and one more thing. Why do you not just retain the ability to get married in the traditional sense and add the provisions for civil union? Because I can see where there might even be 
a man, a heterosexual man and woman who might not want to be married, right. but might prefer a civil union for whatever reason. Right. So, we, we thought about that. I mean, other states have done that. Like I said, there's a couple states that have civil unions specifically for same-sex couples. My opinion in drafting this is that we abandoned the separate but equal doctrine in 1954 in the Brown v. Board decision. And I think that when you tell a couple, you know, you can get civilly unionized, but you can't get married, that's sort of like telling them you can sit here, but you can't sit there. So it was just a matter of, you But know, now you're telling the people who want to actually be married that they have to have a civil union. Why don't we just provide for everybody and s so they can have their choice? If, 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 if I want to get married, let me get married. If right. I want to have a civil union, let me get civil, you if, know, If it were union. up to me and we could just have a same sex, you know, a, a true marriage equality bill, that would be my preference. But in, an, in analyzing this and in, you know, having initial discussions about what, where I should go, I realized the makeup of the legislature and I realized that you know, it, it's an issue of contention. So I tried to take a different approach that would maybe serve as a compromise for both sides of the aisle. Satisfy the private sector in, you know, not infringing upon the religious freedoms by allowing same-sex couples to become married, but then also providing the equal protection that the Constitution mandates we provide. I think what you're actually doing is probably causing more of a controversy for the legislature by taking out the possibility of marriage. And that's, that's a valid opinion, you know, and, you know, that's why we have a deliberative process. So I appreciate your opinion and your questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, hi, Tito. Uh, good job. Congratulations. A um, couple things. Uh, let me say first off the bat, um, with all due respect to the representative from Carlisle, I don't, um, I, I somewhat took issue with uh, any comparison of suggesting that related people should be able to get married versus same-sex couples having a civil union. Um, I, I, th I don't think that, that there's any relationship between incest and, and uh, same-sex couples. And um, so, you know, it's my personal opinion. I, I didn't really uh, think that was necessary. Um, again, no disrespect meant for that. Um, I did want to ask you about page 13 section B because uh, you mentioned for religious organizations that you add or civil union to marriage in there, which marriage, as, as Carrie pointed out, is still defined in there. Um, uh, now, if, if the government is going to handle civil unions and marriage is strictly going to be a religious ceremony, then should that section just be uh, changed more or, or eliminated in, in that it, it basically grants religious organizations the ability to have civil unions? You know, I, when we were drafting this part of the legislation, it was really contentious among the people that were like-minded about my bill. We weren't sure if we should leave that as an option for the people that may feel disenfranchised as a result of marriage not being official at all. So we wanted to just include that as an option for solemnization. Um, it's, you know, in, in hindsight, maybe it is just a, it's just a better idea to eliminate in its entirety, and, you know, the representative mentioned it, you mentioned it, so maybe it's something that we can think about um, moving forward. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. <clears throat> I have uh, two questions, but a comment, if I can preface it following up with uh, Dean, uh, and somewhat defense of the representative, I think if I'm understanding it correctly, I think he was trying to address the slippery slope aspect of this. Um, this is a philosophical issue. It's an ideolo ideological issue. I'm sure all of us in this room could probably stand here and talk about this for a millennium. There'd probably be a split down the middle. Very controversial subject matter, so I don't even want to get in the weeds too far on it. Um, but from a philosophical perspective, I think the representative was trying to touch on that, that if you want to redefine the term marriage, okay, something that was understood to be an institution for a millennium, um, not by government, but by societies themselves, uh, and you want to change it to civil union, and this is going to lead into my question, so I'm not trying to be um, no, you philosophical here, but right. you change it to civil union, then at what point do you draw the line and say we're going to stop because now you want to 
create civil unions to be whatever, and then turn around and say, well, you know what, we have constitutional protections and we need to apply equal protection to everybody, then somebody could stand up, even if they're 2% of the uh, population or 5% of the population, and say, well, you know what, I need my constitutional protections. I, want, I think we should be able to do, why? When do we stop? And that leads me into my next my question. You mentioned, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe I heard you say in your opening uh, presentation that government should not be involved, so you want to return it to the people. Is that, is that the gist of it? In terms of marriage? Yes. Yeah, okay. You're amending Title 23, domestic relations. I understand why, because we define the term marriage in there. Right. If you really want to remove the government from making that decision, because by putting a bill like this before the General Assembly, it is government making that decision because ultimately it's going to be the governor who signs it, it becomes law. So they already made a decision as it relates to marriage, as you define it. If you really want to go there, this is my suggestion, then why not make it a joint resolution that has to go before the House and Senate on two successive sessions and then before the general population because you mentioned polls that show that there's a change, there's a societal change as well. So I think if you want to go that, if that's your premise of making the change, then I suggest you give it to the people after the legislature has spoken on two occasions and then take it from there. I think that would legitimize your premise a sure. little more. Um, and you're right, uh, one final uh, question I have is on the Supreme Court. They haven't decided yet. We don't know where that's right. going to go. That could just blow everything up. Right. But, you're right, you mentioned that it might go back to the states, and I believe that follows up with what I, adds to what I said is, let's give it to the people then. But thank you. Thank you. Hi, Carrie. Dito, I have a really quick question. Did you touch base with anyone at Revenue to see how this would affect people's tax filings? Um, just out of curiosity, I'm not sure what that language looks like, but if, say, you know, this this would go through, and I'm getting married in in October, um, and now my husband and I are filing as a civil union. Would that affect, you know, how, did, did you touch base with anyone or um, not? So much? It should, I I didn't touch base with any of the committees or anything um, with that specific issue, but from what I understand, it wouldn't. I mean, it wouldn't affect anything. Everything would be the same. It's just more people would be able to, you know, file jointly. Right. Okay. I was just thinking since tax day is on Monday, you know. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a good question. Thank you, Carrie. Hi. Hi. I just have a quick question. Sure. Um, your general idea is to make it not a government decision of what marriage is. I get that. I mean, there's right. complications in writing this bill and, you know, the language you have to mm -hmm. choose. Um, but you would want, like, a business. Say I own a business mm -hmm. and I have men, women who are married. I also have... Um, a man and a man who want to be a civil union, they want the benefits, they want everything that comes with being married. Mm -hmm. You want me to be able to decide whether I will agree with that and whether I deem a man and a man or a woman and a woman as having the same rights when it comes to insurance or filings or household or children, but then you want me to also recognize if that man and a man came from Virginia and they accept it as civil union, then I have to accept it as civil union. Right. Therefore, that erodes my my right, as you would say, sure. to, you know, to decide whether or not I will accept that. Isn't right. that a little bit contradiction there? It's a, it's a, good, it's a good concern. It's a good question. Um, I'm going to cite the Constitution, Article 4, Section 1. Full faith and credit shall be given to each state to the public acts records and judicial proceedings of every other state, and the Congress may by general law pres prescribe the manner in which such acts, records, and proceedings shall be proved and the effects thereof, which is why I included this provision where um, we would recognize the civil unions or marriages of other states. Now, I think that we've had these discussions about whether private businesses should be allowed to, you know, discriminate against, against a specific couple, and, you know, we, we decided that it's, it shouldn't be. You know what I mean? Like, we just, this was an issue 50 years ago with another group of people, and just, this is just a matter of opinion, you know? So, like, right. that's why we do have a, de a, a deliberative process, and I understand that this is, this is an issue of contention. People will not agree. 
with everything that I've set up here, and I may not agree with everything that the audience has said, but um, in my opinion, I don't think that private businesses should be able to discriminate against anyone based on something, a, a qualification related to your sexual orientation or gender identity. Right, well that's just, that's the point that I was trying to make, yeah. that's the issue that I was trying to make. Sure. You don't believe that private businesses should be able to discriminate, you, should, no. you believe that private businesses, like I'm a private business owner, right. I have to accept a man and a man, and then a woman and a woman, but then I don't have the right you see what I mean? Like that was just the, the situation right. that I was a little bit confused about because you want private businesses to have that option, but then you don't want them to have that option. They'll have that option in terms of marriage. The private sector will have control over marriage, but if there's a, there's a different spousal relation, if, if the argument is, this is what I said earlier, if the argument is that marriage is a holy institution, then m the goal of my bill, and maybe there are some problems with the, with the language, and that's something that I can look into. I appreciate everything that you said. Um, if, if the argument is that it's, it's, a, it's a holy institution, then the government needs to be out of it and allow the churches to, to decide what will be defined as marriage. But the government still has to offer a spousal relationship because there are legal rights that the churches don't provide. It's, just, it's strictly a, a government thing, you know what I mean? Like taxes, that kind of thing, hospital, hospital visitation rights, inheritance rights, that's not something that the church handles, that's something that the government handles. And so um, you'll have a right to determine what marriage is but that doesn't give you the right to discriminate against another group of people. Well, can you give me an example of that? Maybe I'm not understanding correctly. Okay. You want a, a private business owner to, to decide what they believe marriage is. What is, give me an example. I want to, okay, so if the church wants to decide, if the Catholic Church, for example, wants to decide that marriage, that they want to continue their definition of marriage being between one man and one woman, they can do that. And they can officiate matrimonial ceremonies in their church only between one man and one woman. Civil unions will replace marriage as the government sanctioned spousal relationship. And th anybody can get married. Any two adult people that are not related and consenting to being a part of this civil union. That's, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm trying to focus more. I'm, maybe I'm just not connecting with you right here. Okay. Um, I'm talking about private business. Like, right. I make whistles. Yeah. You want me to be able to define what I believe marriage is? No. That's not what you're saying? No. Okay. I just want the churches to, you know what I mean? If, if the churches don't want to officiate. Oh, so private business, you mean churches. Yeah, because so, okay. a private, if you make whistles, you don't officiate a, a marriage, right. you know what I mean? That it's was just my, a, that was my confusion. When you said private sector, I immediately right. thought I own a business, I'm a small business owner, but you just mean religious institutions. Any institution that officiates okay. marriage, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you.